Scott, how you hey, doing, buddy? Hey, man, how's it going? Good, good to see you. I want to start talking to you about, I don't want to embarrass you or anything, but I know your trajectory in writing. You started off like a house on fire. You spent a lot of time with your family, and now you're really, you're an apartment complex on fire. You've had a book of stories, you know, in 2017. You got this novel. You got a memoir coming out in a couple months, I think, right? In March, in March yeah. yeah. Well, that's a couple months. That's a couple and months. Then, and then another novel, right? Yeah, coming out in June. Golly. Uh, you're and, also... I got, and, I got, and I got another thing that I can't talk about yet, but there's, there'll be an announcement about that in a, in a few weeks. I don't so yeah, it's just it's so, weird, man. You know, I don't know why. I mean, you, you know, you know how the publishing world is. You just never know what's going to happen. And, and I, I, I like to think that they just got tired of rejecting me, and they just said, "Look, he's been he's been around long enough. Let's just let's just it, maybe a, it might be a sympathy publish, you know, or something like that." <laughs> but, uh, uh, you got any? You got a book of poetry on the horizon? <laughs> no, no poetry. <laughs> book, book. <laughs> no, no. It's another book of stories, actually. So, what, what do you like writing best? Stories or the novels or the memoir? Um, all the same. You know, I don't, I, I don't really know how to answer that because I don't really know that I know what I'm doing yet writing a novel. Um, I feel like I'm still kind of learning, and and it's fun to do it. Yeah. Um, but I do like I do like short stories. I like you know, and you know this because you you do the same thing. You get this. You get this little thread going and you say, okay, I've got a in 5,000 words. I need to finish this thing. I need to yeah. wrap this up. And you, and you feel that, that uh, compulsion and that sort of tension to finish it up. But, you know, you remember uh, years ago, you and I were talking and, and you, I think you were talking about Clyde Edgerton and you said, he said, he told you, Oh, writing a novel is easy. You just get 10 stories about the same kind of guy, same person and just make them, each one 20 pages long and you got a novel. And, and I think I, I still do that kind of like, cause there's a lot of set pieces in the, in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, uh, the memoir was a whole different thing. Cause it was just, it was, uh, you know, and it's, it's lasted over a number of years. I've gone back and rewritten it as I've gotten older and it's changed the, the, the tone and the attitude of it. But, uh, but I, I think I, I still like, I still like writing stories. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this. Flannery O'Connor, you know, said, uh, I think, uh, you know, if you live, this is paraphrase, if you live through your childhood, you got enough to write about the rest of your life. And if we go back and look at Strangers to Temptation, and then if we look in Whereabouts, they're both, they're both primarily in King Street, South Carolina. And you have a line in this novel. Now I'm going to look down and read it because I'm not one of those. I can't remember anything. Uh, a small southern town uh doesn't give up on its young easily that's a really beautiful line and it made me stop and think you know and what when you wrote that i mean there's different ways to interpret that what did you kind of have in mind or do you think you know the idea that the, the town doesn't give up its young is i just i remember i just thought back to to where i grew up in king street and how many people i knew who had you know, maybe taking a little, a little, a route out to college or done something, and then they come back and they all, they come back and it's, and they're, they marry the high school sweetheart and they sort of stay there in it. And now, you know, with Facebook, the way it is, you, you reconnect with all these people and you see that their kids are coming back and staying there. And I don't know that's necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just, you know, it just seemed like that seems to be a pattern that I've noticed in some of these small towns that yeah, I'm, you know, I'm from Greenwood and it's the same thing. And I used to kind of make some light of it and say, you know, pretty soon everybody, there's only so many families and they intermarry and intermarry and intermarry pretty soon the gene pool, you can walk across the gene pool without getting your ankles wet. <laughs> um, I don't want to do a, this is kind of a spoiler alert, but um, I don't know if I should, I don't know if I can say this. I'll go ahead. Our character, our main character, Missy Ballou, escapes the small town. Right. And she lives a life for about a, a year, maybe a little over a year. I think yeah. this novel starts off in 1968, and probably, as I can tell, ends about 1970 or in the, yeah. in the 1970 time or something like that. And she comes back. Uh, so it's part picaresque novel. There's this travel stuff around it, but there's also that 
yeah, you can go home kind of aspect to it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I, um, I know you, uh, we've talked about this before, this, this whole idea of stories making that circular motion of coming back and sort of kissing the beginning again. And uh, I thought, I, I like the idea of a character doing all this motion and, and traveling in a circle. I, yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I had a, uh, there was a football coach at Lexington High School uh, one time that he, he, I don't know why he was talking to us because I was a basketball player, but he had us in a room and he was saying, boys, world ain't nothing but a circle. You're always going to come back around. You're always going to see the same people. And that, and I thought, man, that's sort of a, now that I think about it, that's sort of a nice story thing. Yeah. To think about that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to encounter this thing on the way back. So that's sort of what I was thinking about when I was writing this. There are some um, parts of this novel that a big chunk of the novel takes a big chunk of the novel takes place in a in a funeral home, and a and a big chunk of the novel takes place in a motel set across a two lane highway from a ex little pancake house. Yeah, um, and you have written about these places, and and then there's part not a big chunk, but an important a really important part of that um, abbey, you know, where the where the monk. Yeah. Lived. Did you do? a bunch of research do you know if you worked as a short order cook that's what my question is <laughs> but i filled my face at a short at the waffle house plenty of times no actually what i was fascinated with is those places that and, and in the 70s and, and you know this because you and i are roughly the same age you're older of course but uh uh you know those highways on the way to the beach those, those two and four lane highways on the way to the beach, the, uh, the minute the interstates came in, they died. And, yeah. and, uh, and some of them hung on barely, you know, like the, the little diners and the hotels hung on. You still see them today when you go down yeah. the highway. And uh, I was always fascinated with that is the fact that, uh, you know, these interstate highways come on and this whole route, this whole economic thing that was happening on these highways just just died I and mean, it, it died quick so uh you know I, I wanted to put part of the book there um and you know and I think you know I yeah I honestly the the short order stuff just came from me spending way too much time in waffle houses yeah and watching people work and all that kind of stuff um but yeah I was I you know I um uh, I just there were certain places I remember when I was a kid going to eat like I remember there's a place outside of King Street, and I don't remember which highway, 621 maybe or something, there was a place, and we would go there for Sunday dinner about once a month, and you would just see the traffic was just steady all, all the whole time, people going back and forth to the beach. Yeah. And, and then three years later, it, it closed down. It was gone. At some point, there's a, there's a small highway. This skips off subject a little bit. I apologize. Right. It might be 301 or 37. It's a town that goes like, kind of from Columbia to Hampton, Allendale. Kind yeah, of. that's 301, right? 301, and there used to be this gigantic coffee pot on the side of the road. Did you see? I mean, <laughs> it, the house, it was just a coffee pot, and I think you went through the door. It was closed down by the time I, you know, found this place. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I'm fascinated with those places, too. And, you know, and that's, and that's the time, you know, you, you know, you were talking about these two books being kind of set in the 70s, or late 60s, early 70s, and I'm just... That's, that's the time when a lot was going on and, you know, when I was 12, 13 years old and, and, uh, you know, um, the next, the next book is contemporary. It's not, it's not set back then. I think I've, I've mined the seventies for all I can right now, but, but that, that time, I just, the music of that time and just those, those things like the places shutting down on the highway. That's, that's just, that's good stuff for stories. I want to talk a little bit with you about um, voice and language. There are some lines in here in this in this novel. It's called Whereabouts, and it's available at Malaprops in Asheville um, and other fine independent bookstores. You have some lines in here that made me just stop. I either I either just want well, most of the time it was man, I wish I'd have thought of that, and that's <laughs> my, that's my biggest compliment. You know, that's one not- was uh, my <laughs> I can't believe my dad never said this to me, but you have a character say it looked like she learned how to whisper in a sawmill, you know? I mean, that's so much better than saying like, she was really loud and people could overhear her. And another one was, 
when Mona is working on a corpse, putting makeup on a corpse, and her daughter, Missy, is watching her, and I think that's how that goes, and Missy says, she didn't do the dead drunk. That's, funny. first of all, that line comes out funny because of dead drunk. But, you know, uh, this is an unfair, I, I mean, I'll go ahead and be, I'll go ahead and tell them myself, I steal things from everybody that I possibly can. Oh, yeah. This pandemic has been tough because you ain't going around talking to human beings, you know, um, uh, unless you're some genius person. But how much do you, how much do you think growing up did you are you able to go? Oh yeah, my uncle so and so used to talk like this, or my oh, aunt down in Alabama. Oh, I steal steal like a thief in the night, man. I steal. Yeah. I mean, my dad. That's that's the line my dad used to always say. You know, we would be we'd be in the back seat of the car, my sister and I, and we'd be like talking like this, like we were whispering. He said, you learn to whisper in a sawmill. And, yeah. you know, and I, that sticks with you. And you just, I mean, but I think, uh, well, who was it? Was it Picasso said all artists theft? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you and I used to sit, when we taught at the governor's school, we used to go down to the dining hall. You remember this? And we would sit at the table and have lunch with the other, on, like usually on a Monday, and it'd be all the people from the, telling stories about what happened on the weekend. And yeah. I remember more than once you, you were sitting across from each other and someone would start telling about something they, that happened to them strange on the weekend. And you'd look at me and I'd look at you and you'd say, whose turn is it? Yeah. Say, yeah. Oh, this is yours. So you would steal that one. And it would show up in a short story sometime later. Um, and I think, you know, I think if you're, a, I think any writer in some way does that, steals, observes, keeps yeah. your, keep your ears open, keep your eyes open take from the world uh, and there was a lot of that in here you know I mean um, you know the 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 compass on the dashboard uh, my yeah. dad my dad had a compass on the dashboard that kind of floated there like that and you always know which way you were going um, you know um, watching the people uh, you know work the grill at the at the at the Waffle House you still you, you know that's yeah. I, mean, I, I know I don't want to downplay anything but I'm not making up a, a yeah, well, I mean, also, uh, I mean, you just have to say, they're probably not going to go become a writer. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and take this. You also have to realize a lot of times kind of blue collar people have just a better kind of language. I mean, oh, yeah. I'm sitting and listening to them than uh, people who are running for Senate in um, Georgia right now. <laughs> hey, were you and, and, and there you went. And there you went. <laughs> were, were, you, uh, were you read a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, before I read, I want to say thanks to Malaprops. Um, listen, Malaprops is one of the great indie bookstores around, and and yeah, in America, yeah. In this in this time, we need to be supporting indie bookstores, and so you can go to Malaprops, and this is and this is George's latest book, and this thing is a, an amazing collection of stories, and if you guys. And a lot of dope. There, I can't see anybody, but if you don't know George's work, I, I'm I'm thinking that a lot of you do because there's not many people that don't know your work. But uh, I got you know this uh, this is amazing. I don't know how you were able to pick. I mean, it's, that, that was was that a? I'll I'll, I'll read. I promise. But you read. <laughs> uh, yeah, but this is this is great. Anyway, you can get this malprops and you can get my book at malprops and uh, I'm going to read a little piece. Um, um, there's, uh, the main character, as George mentioned, is named Missy Ballou and Missy's uh, mother is named Mona and, uh, Mona's husband, Missy's dad dies very early. Well, in, on the first page of the book. So, uh, that's, I guess that's pretty early. Um, and, uh, he uh, Mona falls for the funeral director named Asa Floyd, and they are uh, they get married and they're going on their honeymoon. And Mona had wanted to go to the Caribbean, but they didn't go because uh, Asa had a free place to stay at Polly's Island because he'd taken care of somebody's family, and you know he had a free place to stay at Polly's Island. And uh, Mona has been known to 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 have a drink or two. Uh, in her, in her time. And, um, they're on the way to, they're uh, driving over to the funeral home so they can leave on the honeymoon and, and Missy and Mona are in the car. And, uh, Missy, uh, Mona starts to recollect about her first honeymoon. 
and that's what this section is. So let me, I don't know, is that, is that enough set up, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, Mona drew a breath with a hint of a smile. He took me to the mountains. He planned this whole trip out. I, I know that doesn't surprise you, him and his planning. We went to a little town called Bat Cave. Can you imagine that? A town called Bat Cave. We stayed at an inn called the Esmeralda. If you opened the windows at night, you could hear a little creek rushing across the rocks right outside your window. We stayed in the same exact room where that's, this California fellow once lived for a while and wrote the script for that chariot movie. What was it? Ben-Hur, that's it. Isn't that interesting? Mona stared at the street, but her eyes were somewhere else. Missy saw it. She knew her mother had started to drift, looking through the pea soup fog of years gone by, back to a time when she was a bride comfortable enough to be lulled to sleep by the noise of white water through an open window. Missy wondered how in the world her daddy had decided on some place called Bat Cave for a honeymoon. It was just like him. Drag somebody you love to a place simply because it sounded different. Mona continued talking so low, Missy had to lean toward the middle of the seat to hear her over the hum of the engine and the rush of air through the still open window. The Esmeralda smelled like wood smoke and mothballs. It was October and believe me, it was chilly up in the mountains. But every night your father would crack the windows and take a breath and tell me that it was the best tasting air he'd ever put in his mouth. I loved it when he said things like that, you know, things you didn't expect. Mona pulled into a drive that led to the rear of the funeral home. Missy saw Ace's face framed in the window of his office, watching as they drove past. She turned back to her mother. There were those subtle hints again, signals they were related. She and her mother had the same lift to their eyebrows and lips constantly half puckered in a near pout. Mona had beautiful skin and Missy was grateful she bequeathed it to her daughter. I'm nervous because I'm scared your daddy's watching me, Mona said. Her mother suddenly appeared older and brittle and her fear wasn't like a kid's, not the kind brought on by a nightmare or a screech in the dark, but a fear that began somewhere down deep and rode the blood to every inch of the body. It was a fear of having made a mistake that couldn't be corrected without a considerable amount of pain and grief. So why in the world did you, she started, but before she could finish, Asa had his head in the driver's side window. Now, he said loudly through the glass, isn't that a sweet scenario? M and M, teary-eyed from goodbyes. Parting is such sweet sorrow and all that. It's only for a few days, ladies. Mona rolled down the window and Asa leaned in. His breath filled the car with a bitter scent of Listerine. He waited a second for a response and when it didn't come, he just plodded on. I'm all but ready to whisk you away, my dear. Got your bags packed? Missy, do you have things that you'll need? Have the things that you'll need? Clarence, step around here and give us a hand with these suitcases. Behind Asa, Clarence hung back, glancing up at the trees, then farther into the sky. Asa's words hit his ears late, like they came on the breeze from a faraway place and needed translating, but he suddenly perked up and headed for the trunk of the car. Asa was already there, taking out bags and putting them on the ground. Lord, Mona, what do you have in here, cement? He ran around to the window again and peered in at the two of them. You know you don't have to pack that many clothes. He winked and took off again for the back of the car. I can't do it, Mona whispered. What? Missy leaned over in the front seat, closer to her mother. I can't go away with him. I like him all right when there's other people around, but if I have to be with him all alone for such a long stretch of time, I just don't know what I'll do. Mona reached under the seat and pulled out a small bottle of something clear. I can't do it, she repeated. This is the cheapest fortitude I could find on short notice. Mona tucked the bottle in her pocketbook. You've been doing so good, Missy said. Come on now. It's momentary, Missy, Mona said. Asa was suddenly back again, his face in theirs. And now the time has come, my dear, to head for the closest thing we have to the Caribbean. Your chariot awaits. He hollered and pulled the door open. Mona started to ease out of the car, then whispered back at Missy. Why do you think he said chariot? Why now? There are so many chariots in Ben-Hur. I haven't seen that movie in years. She tried to smile and slid toward the door, dragging her pocketbook behind her. Yeah, that's cool. Is that a true story about uh, the writer of Ben Hur up in that cave? Yep, stole that too. Yeah, I What's went up. There, I went up there one time and they got it like somewhere in the hotel. They have, uh, and I think the Esmeralda is still open. Anyway, the guy who wrote Ben Hur wrote it 
while he was staying there, supposedly. Wow. That's a cool yeah. story. That's a good reading, too. Okay. Listen, you have uh, Missy, you know, is uh, starts off, she's seven, just about to turn 18 years old at the beginning of the novel. She's headstrong, intelligent, um, curious. You know, she wants to know what, it's like that country, country songs, you know, she's stuck here and wants to get there. And then when she gets there, she wants to get back home. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to use the word sassy, but she just ca- kind of is. And she's really big hearted. And Clarence, a minor character, is really big hearted and a great character. And Hassan, a really, a really um, major character who owns the motel and the ex little pancake house, has a really big heart. But then you got this character named Skiles. Do you want to talk a little bit about Skiles? In a weird way, I hadn't thought about this, but you know, we learn about Misty's biological father being a slight wanderer. You know, he's got the, the compass on a thing and he, yeah. he wants to wander and stuff. And, and Skiles is a wanderer too, but also kind of a know-it-all. That scene about him uh, getting small town newspapers and getting out a knife to cut out articles just so he can say stupid things like uh, there are more rabid raccoons in South Carolina per capita than anywhere else. Yeah. You know, he's always coming up with these things, but where did you come up with Skiles? Um, I wanted um, to get her out of town. I, 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 if I, if I remember correctly, I was thinking about somebody who would be attracted she would be attracted to this, this guy who had the, the truck and he could take off at a moment's notice and leave town. He could come back, but he always could leave he, back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, she loved to travel because you, you get this because of her father, but Skiles is this, this older guy. He's got the, the long ponytail and he's, he's older than she is. And he's also her third cousin, which, yeah. which throws a little, a little narrative hurdle there in, uh, into the story. But, yeah, but I, I wanted somebody who you had to have you had to have the mean the, the guy that 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 you know the villain and I guess that he's he's a he's he's that in a way but he's but she she likes she's attracted to him because he can move because he's got because of the motion because mm-hmm. she can take him out of that place and that's you need I think you needed that guy to to be as bad as he was to turn her back toward home. Yeah. And, and not and not go with him because she doesn't know where he's going to go. He's the kind of guy. He doesn't have any plans. He just he just gets in the truck, drives, gets a tank of gas and starts going. And, and he's in a enigma. We don't know where he gets his money. We know he's in Vietnam. Probably yeah. uh, he limps. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, he get, he's he's enough of a mystery that he's interesting, but he's also he, he's not a nice guy. You know, he's, he's but, you know, and, and you give him, and, you know, I was giving him some quirks, you know, I, I um I, you remember when they, they used to have the newspapers that were the really big newspapers, and there were times when they would put those little filler things in the in the columns that would be just just trivial information. And, uh, and Fun he, facts. Yeah. yeah, and and he just collects them, and because that's that's his that's his he he owns that intelligence. He collects mm-hmm. those facts, and it it was fun to write that character. I mean, it's, you know, it's it, he's a fun character to write. Uh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and on the other hand, so you got him with always wanting to be on the move and all that. Then you got Hassan, and I don't, I don't know if you meant, and I thought about it. It took until uh, the last two or three pages for me to think, oh, but there's kind of some magical realism going on in here, and I don't want to scare people off thinking, oh crap, man, gave me a hundred years of solid food or whatever that book's called, but. <laughs> But Hassan says to Missy Blue, I will always know where you are. And it, then he kind of does. And he, yeah. he really takes care of her. And he, Hassan, the owner of the motel, is a real homebody, except for when he's driving his Cadillac around town a little bit. Um, I mean, he, want, he tries to make up a room for her. You know, he paints it. He wants normal stay at home. I'm good with this. He got the opposite with Skiles. I mean, I don't know if you were thinking about that, you know. Yeah, but but also he's yeah, but he you know uh, Hassan is he wants to travel, but he only does it with the brochures, the posters, yeah, the posters. He has travel posters up on his walls and stuff, and that's so that's as far as he's going to be able to get. Yeah, um, so that that was sort of thing. Yeah, he 
he was a, you know, I, 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 that he, he grew out of that idea of could somebody come into these places that closed down, take them over and make it his little version of the American dream. And then of course yeah. that was to make him not an American uh, or not a native born American. And then, uh, and then uh, that whole idea of, you know, he thinks Missy's just this gift from, from above that she shows up and things start going well. And that, so we got to play a little bit with religion there and that sort of thing. So yeah, he's the Madonna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was, uh, I just, I loved writing about that Cadillac of his man. I, I, that, did you ever know anybody had a Cadillac like that with the big, with the big fins and all that kind of stuff? Convertible. Oh, you ass. My father, <laughs> my father died. My father died. You, you had, your dad had one. He had a 1963 that he bought. It had those huge fins. I had to drive it at times. Um, I was embarrassed about it. I was really embarrassed. But that thing, and I, I remember going on I-85 one time and seeing these kids about my age pointing and making fun of me because it took about five minutes for that thing to get 50. And then it took about three seconds for it to go 120. And man, I was fly by people in the big fins. And I'll tell you who else, our, our buddy Ron Rash, his dad had one and Ron wrote an autobiographical story from his very first collection about, he was out on a date, it was like one of his first dates, and it was raining and he had the headlights on and the windshield wipers and people coming toward him all got off on the side of the road because they thought a funeral was coming <laughs> toward him, you know? <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. I um, wish I still had that 1963 Cadillac. Oh, I know. Those are great. I mean, there's like aircraft carriers. It took forever to stop stop them. Um, yeah. Oh, and you drove like this. <laughs> hey, you got anything else uh, before we go to people asking questions? Oh, we're only 30 minutes. Hey, Stephanie, tell me, how are we doing? Or Patricia, we're doing okay? You got anything else you want to yeah, talk we're good about on time. that I didn't ask, Scott? Um, You know, um, I tell you, one thing is this, this uh, been interesting is like you know this is from uh uh this book is told from a female point of view and uh, yeah. and i and i i thought you know i, I didn't know how that was going to go over um if yeah. and when the book ever got out and um i mean i i, I kind of worried about it a little bit because you know it's it's i want to do it justice and do it good and uh and i, th I think it's working but uh yeah, that, that was a concern, but I was writing this story for my daughters way back when, when they were little and, uh, yeah, you know, and I wanted to, you know, and I wanted to write about a female character that was like you said, sassy and strong and independent and smart and, and was able to recover from some maybe not so good decisions to make some really good decisions. And, uh, and that was, that was, that was kind of a concern for a while, but, uh, it's, so far I haven't, it hasn't been a complaint. You said this spawned from a from one of those short stories in uh, in uh, New Southern Harmonies, or I forget where that was first published. Black Warrior Review, or yeah, or, yeah. It, it, there was a short story, and uh, I, I, I um, you you're gonna know part of this story because all right. So I wrote this short story. It's in Black Warrior Review, and uh, somebody saw it, like an agent saw it, and and agents see short stories. What's the first thing they ask you when you? Yeah when you write a novel, got a novel, got a novel, got a novel. And, uh, and I didn't at that point. And I t thought about that story. And what I decided to do was write a novel. And I took that story and said, I'm going to put this right in the middle. So that story, that story basically occurs or the most of that story occurs, occurs, occurs in the middle. And I thought, what, what happened to get them to that point? And then mm -hmm. what happened after that story? So that's, that that's the story that short story is sort of the center point of the novel yeah uh, uh the short story is the section where she uh she finds out uh, guys keep scratching stuff in the bathroom stall louise he's putting louise on the, yeah. the louise graffiti yeah. on the so that 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 was that was the story so yeah that was kind of interesting just to try to write because i didn't know what i was doing maybe still don't but just to take that short story and say you know take these 12, 15 pages, write to it, write up to it, and then write after it. Well, no pressure, but you know, it's, it's also 
kind of lends itself for a sequel. You know <laughs> what happens? No, no. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to do uh, the spoiler. I don't want to say what happened. But after Missy comes back, it it ends with her uh, looking at the monks again. You know. Right. Uh, but then there's going to be some some. She's going to be faced with a lot of uh, small town nosy people questions and and oh yeah yeah you know, see where that but don't think about that no thanks, credit. For, thanks for bringing that up george i <laughs> appreciate that a lot jeez i got enough problems you know <laughs> I'm just sitting around banging your head trying to think of it not you me trying to think of a story <laughs> idea all right uh can we go to questions now from the the audience you think that's okay we we sure can if y'all are ready um and uh, we've got we've got um, one from Patricia, and, and we'll get to that in just a moment, um, but I wanted to go ahead and ask y'all as well, if you're ready now to maybe make a book recommendation or two, or to just think about some other books besides each other's, you know, besides your own and each other's. Oh yeah. <laughs> that you yeah. might, that you might like to, to recommend before we um, finish up this evening. Um, so I, I, uh, uh, if you, if you have something right on the top of your head, we can, we can actually talk about I, that now. I can do that right now. Cause, okay. been, Cause I knew when I was doing my little zoom tour, what you've been reading. So I've had to put them all here right beside me so I could look. Oh, excellent. So you can even show them to us. Oh, I could. Yeah. That would be awesome. Okay. Okay, y'all don't go anywhere. <laughs> We're waiting for you. Okay, well, I'll just get, I'll get four. Oh, good, I can get this one. I know y'all are gonna know, I know y'all are gonna know this one because you're in Asheville and she lives nearby, but it's F asterisk CK face. I don't cuss. Y'all might not realize that, but I don't ever cuss, so I won't say the title. I like this book of stories a lot. This is put out by Hub City Press, and it's gotten a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's sad. It's a really beautifully written, heartfelt uh, novel, The Prettiest Star, by Carter Sickles. Sleepovers, is. I'm not pushing Hub City, I swear, but this Ashley Bryant Phillips book is great. It's the first book, and it's really wonderful. And then I got um, M.O. Walsh, his, he goes by Neil. Uh, his name is Milton O'Neill <laughs> Walsh. His name Milton. Anyway, uh, it's called The Big Door Prize. And I like this one a whole lot too. There's another one up here. I, well, there's a few, maybe, maybe they're over there, I don't know. But those are just three or four that I think of. This was, I thought, a good year for books in the, um, in the fall and, you know, the fall season. There were like, golly, a ton of them. Couldn't keep up. Yeah, and that's a that's an observation that um, that we've seen made before as we've been doing the author events because it was a lousy year in a whole bunch of ways. <laughs> twenty twenty yeah. was, but it happened to be a really good year uh, for books, and um, and then of course challenging, you know, for authors because you know your usual kind of touring and all of that stuff doesn't happen, um, and. Uh, you know, and for bookstores and for everybody, right? But but it didn't change the fact that that there were just a lot of really wonderful books that came out in 2020. Yeah. So thank you for that. Patricia's going to post links to those in the chat as as well. And then Scott, why don't we why don't we get a couple of recommendations from you maybe at the end? Okay. Sounds great. All right. Um, Patricia, since you since you have a question in the first person, do you want to go ahead and unmute and hop on and ask your question? Sure, I'll be uh, happy to do that. So Scott, I grew up in a funeral home. And no. so I'm- <laughs> How? <laughs> cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> very uh, unusual. And I'm from Charlotte. And so I grew up in a funeral home, McEwen Funeral Home. Um, and I'm always interested in how funeral homes are portrayed and, uh, because there's, of course, that sort of ghoulish way that you could go, but it's so much more than that. It's a business, yeah. a real business. And, you know, there are employees there who are real characters too. Uh, and so I'm interested, my question was, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting cat bombed. This is my cat, Bob. <laughs> right, right when I go on camera, my cat knows when to show up. So there she right. is. Um, so my question is, how did you, how did you create this kind of funeral home person, 
how did you find out about funeral homes or what was your source? What were your um, sources? Name names. Well, the, 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 the building that I was thinking of was uh, a friend of mine in high school. Her father was uh, a funeral director. And so I remember, and they, they lived in the formal, the former funeral home. So it was a big antebellum house. So this is one of those, this is one of those funeral homes that looks like a big antebellum house. Um, and, uh, and I had kind of done a, a walking tour through it one time. So I remembered what some of the rooms looked like. And, uh, and then, uh, I, I, uh, there's, I'm not gonna do a, a spoiler alert, but, uh, I needed I needed a really creepy character for a really creepy scene, so I made this really really creepy um, funeral director. Um, well, those exist, so uh, that's possible. Yeah. So so anyway, so yeah, the, so that so that's that's uh, but yeah, it was it was from 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 knowing seeing it a couple of times and you know and just uh, kind of taking it from there and playing with some of the details and all that. Um, yeah, you'll have to you have to see if it works. You know, you I to. will. I'm 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 always interested in it because it's this very unusual, rarefied environment in which to grow up, and the people who work in it in the business are and, very different. And and if and if I've got if there's some mistakes and things like that, you have to let me know. So when I have to when I write this damn sequel that George has brought up, I can uh <laughs> I can get it right this time. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, give you some today, at least I'll tell you what it was like in North Carolina. Okay. Today I drove, uh, I had to go to, I have this little credit union that's closed down, thank goodness, all of its places except the one drive through which is in halfway to Greenville, so I'm Wade Hampton Boulevard. But, so I take these back roads, so I went through Duncan and, um, and Greer, and it's funny how the, the most beautiful houses in these small towns are the funeral homes. I mean, they're really gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Did when uh, Patricia were you was it like a big antebellum? Th I mean, it had to be right. We were. Uh, how can I put this? We were the satellite. Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> so we were. So McEwen had like the downtown sort of antebellum kind of very ornate, and then we were out in North Charlotte, uh, and so it just looked sort of house like, but it. It, it wasn't a house. I mean, the house was attached, but it did, it, just, it looked weird because you could tell it had this big expansive yard and lawn and well manicured and the pillars, you know, it has to have oh, some yeah. columns in front of it to make it look stately. And, you know, then, then the used car salesman showed up and tried to sell you stuff. So that's, that's, the, that's the true story behind the funeral home. It, but it, it had a veneer of respectability and um, the um, the kind of, there was a weeping willow in the in the front yard too. Hype. <laughs> that's, Hype. that's good. I like the weeping willow. That just kind of fits somehow. <laughs> it totally fits. Yeah. Patricia, thank you for uh, for welcome. that question and that wonderful uh, digression into the land of funeral home life. Um, uh, yeah, we we'll, we need to try and fit that in to something like that into pretty much every event. We'll figure out how we can, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure out how we can make that happen. Um, so uh, let's, let's go to a question from John. Um, who uh, first says that he's really enjoying the both of y'all's new books. And um, John's asking, are there any other writers who we should be reading? So I kind of already posed that question. We heard a little bit from George and we will hear from Scott as well. The other question uh, for you, Scott, is what are your thoughts on liver pudding? On what? Liver pudding, P-U-D-D-I-N. Oh, liver pudding. Liver pudding. <laughs> Is that, what? Where is that coming from? I don't know. John Sokol. I don't know. I I I know what it is, but I I don't. I, is it in the book? Some did I put? Is there liver pudding in this book somewhere? I don't remember it. 
I don't remember it. It may just, you know, we're uh, like anything goes on um, <laughs> kind of like the internet. So it could just be a, a random question. Um, I, I, mean, out I, of... I think I'm friends with John Sokol. I know I am on Facebook now. There you go. Uh, does John mean liver mush or liver put? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. It's the Liver Mush Festival down in or up in Shelby, North Carolina, <laughs> which is just a uh, um, intellectual mecca for liver mush. Now, kind of I, I, am, I think it'll I think it'll I'm be fine for you to speak to Liver Mush if that's you know. I'm a I'm a fan of uh, I, I I'm a big fan of fried chicken <laughs> livers, but I don't know if that you know that doesn't qualify as mush or pudding. But I love fried chicken livers. Um, that was a that was a uh, a delicacy that my grandmother in Alabama used to make all the time, and that was the only time I ever got them. So I look forward to that. But I don't know. I don't. I'm not a. I'm, I'm not a fan of of liver pudding. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it as as I enter as I enter my uh, my aged years, I could be turned on to new things. You know, start with that and then go toward head cheese and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you remember. Uh, there's that place in Greenville that used to serve brains and eggs. It's closed down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I always, I never ordered that, but yeah. Not good. Well, so thank you for that other, John, thank you for that digression as well. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, funeral homes. And I'm gonna find I'm gonna find Sokol on Facebook, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, what the hell are you talking about? I don't, and I don't know if it's good form to to. Well, you know, the name's in the chat, so if you it's okay no, no, he, to I, say I, it I out think, loud, I think I'm fa we're Facebook. You're first. probably fa yeah. yeah it's, it Facebook. felt like a very familiar yeah, yeah we're Facebook. question, so y'all can hash it out um, <laughs> on, on social media. Um, but yeah, kind of Stephanie hash. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that was good stuff. Not that. See what I did there? Yeah. Good. Wow. Wow. <laughs> You'll be here all night. <laughs> I was just going to let it go, Patricia. <laughs> tip, tip your waiters and waitresses. Oh, no. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So um, there, was a, there was actually a comment about Brown's Barbecue in King Street having oh. this pudding. Um, and uh, I don't have any more questions yet. I, I, there may be a little, there's always a little bit of a lag there. So Scott, do you want to, do you want to launch into some recommendations? After I say that Brown's barbecue is the best barbecue in, in the world, uh, vinegar based, not mustard based. My friend Jackson's over here going, rolling his eyes cause he likes mustard based. But anyway, we can have the vinegar mustard debate later. Um, I've, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, Odie Lindsay's got a novel out called Some Go Home. I'm a big Odie Lindsay fan. I don't know if, uh, if, if George, you know Odie? I don't. Uh, he, he's, he's a great writer, lives up in um, Nashville, I think. And uh, his novel called Some Go Home is, is a really fine novel. I just finished reading um, Annette Clapsaddle's book, uh, Even As We Breathe, uh, to do an article in a, a magazine about her. And I really enjoyed that um, a lot. Um, that was a really fun read. And I've been reading this book by this uh, very, real small book by this unknown writer named Barack Obama. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, actually, I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading that. He needs an ad. Way to go. He <laughs> needs an ad. <laughs> no, The Promised Land is a really good book. I'm, 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 I'm working my way through it. It's, it's, it's a project book. It's like 700 pages long, but it, it's, it's an interesting book on you know, on politics and how, how he, his, his life experience. So, yeah, but if you, if you don't know Odie's book, uh, check it out. And his, he's got a collection of stories. And right now, the his name of his collection is evading me. But, uh, but this, his second book is this novel called Some Go Home. And I, I really enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, speaking of small, of thin books, and this is a thin, no, no, no joke. Um, Lee Smith has a little novella out. Called oh, yeah. Blue Marlin, and Blue it's Marlin's I really like it. And there's this essay at the end. I mean, this is a really a, a mashup of fiction and, and autobiography because in the essay you go, well, yeah, that was in the novel, that was or in the novella, novella. and it's really fun and, and fun to read. There's also a book y'all coming out today. It came out today, and I'm going to do one of these Zoom things in a couple days at another fine independent bookstore, and it's called the. Fortunate Ones, and it's by Ed Tarkington, who lives up in Nashville. 
and I've only read the first hundred pages, but boy, it's it's good. Um, uh, it's going to be real good. I bet y'all have him. I don't know if y'all are going to have him at Malaprops. I kind of bet you do. Yeah, we've got him coming up later in the month. Oh, and I, can I throw one more in there? I, I, um, Patricia, you might know this. This uh, Rebecca McClanahan. Um, she's lived in Charlotte. She's lived in several places. She's from Charlotte, I think. Uh, but she's got a book called a book of essays called "In the Key of New York City," and they're uh, all just it's it's an it's a memoir and essays and um i i keep reading through it go i'm going to use that one for my class i'm going to use that one for my class because they're so wonderful but uh rebecca's a great writer great writer so i'll, I'll just go ahead and, and put a plug for the for the youtube channel that we're on right now we just um we hosted rebecca mcclanahan and sebastian matthews um in conversation oh. in the summer when they, they both had memoirs out about the same time so you can check that out actually um, on the malaprops youtube channel um, we also have a video up of ashley bryant phillips author of sleepovers um, and that was a delightful conversation um, as well um, and uh, annette sanuk clapsaddle We've got a video of her as well, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that. And um, Odie Lindsay did an event with uh, Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. Um, and so the um, SIBA Reader Meet Writer, um, the SIBA YouTube channel, the Reader Meet Writer TV has, has video there as well. So while you're here, um, you can just you know, click on through and, and check out uh, so you know some more of these uh, authors. Um, and and um, actually, uh, the video isn't up yet because we had some technical difficulties, but it's coming. Um, Leah Hampton um, also, so um, keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, I, I might be missing somebody else. Actually, <laughs> we've done we've done a bunch, and and we always enjoy it. And thank you both so much for giving the, the that space and time to other writers. Um, uh, and we 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 really it's something that we've come to enjoy about these events, and um, and everybody always has such great recommendations, and and it, it always feels like such a nice community you know, hearing writers talk about it. Yeah, kind of, we're all in it together. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. Yep. Um, so I do have another question um, and uh, it's about writing um, and, and whether or not uh, COVID has affected um, writing for you. Um, it, I, I, not, not really. It's, it's affected obviously the, what happens after you write and something happens to get published because that's, that's changed, but the actual being able to sit down and write, you know, hasn't really changed all that much. You know, you still carve out that time and you still, you're still sitting there at the desk by yourself. Um, like always. Now I know a lot of, a lot of people might uh, write in different places. They, they, I know a lot of writers that, go to coffee shops or something like that to write, but I write at home. So it hasn't really affected the, the process so much. Uh, what's been um, different is, is having books come out during the, during the COVID era where you can't really go to bookstores and, and, and see people and have, and have them come up and talk to you about your work and things like that. And I, I really miss that. I miss that. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, uh, sitting down, getting your butt in the seat, getting the words on the page, getting the ugly first draft down, that's that's sort of stayed the same for me, really. George, did you have anything on that? Nah, you know, same thing. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I write at home too. I mean, when I talk about to Scott about, I kind of miss hearing more people's voices. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've actually, I've, I've probably written more, I guess, just because what else is there to do in South Carolina? You know, <laughs> I have a different thing on the, you know, I like going out on book tour and seeing people and meeting them too, but I get real nervous and real scared. And I thought, okay, this zoom thing is going to be a blast, but it's just as bad because I'm still nervous and scared about, you know, I've had a few of them where my computer just went, you know, away for a while or you couldn't get onto it or, the first one I did where people were saying all these things off to the side. So I was looking and most of them were like, Hey, where's your possum? 
how are the dogs doing? And I, and I was trying to look at that, you know, so it's been a different, a different experience doing this, but I, I think I would rather be out on the road in person. Although yeah. these have been lovely. Um, the ones that have worked like this one. Thank, well, thank you for that. Um, we're, in, we're in a similar space, you know, as, cause we're, you know, we're booksellers and, and this whole sort of like online and video thing is not, not really in our comfort zone either. Yeah. We would yeah. all, we would all rather yeah. be together in the store with, with, you know, readers and authors and hanging out. Um, but it is nice that we've got an option um, while it's foolhardy to gather in groups yeah. um, in enclosed spaces. Yeah. So thank, and thank y'all for, for well, doing this. And folks, this. especially now, I think folks need to understand that if they want books, they can still get books from a bookstore they don't have to go to that place we won't mention to get, they can go to Malaprops online. They can go to indie, um, you know, to bookshop.org or IndieBound and, and they can get books that way. And, and if you're a readers and you, and you love books, this is, gosh, we got to support these, we got to support bookstores now more than ever. Um, it's, 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 it, and there's no, there's no reason not to, if you, if you, if you want to, you know, they can go on your website and then they can order the book just like everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you for that. We really appreciate it. There, there, no money exchanged hands y'all. That was, <laughs> that was, that was genuine. And, it it and, is genuine. I promise. <laughs> and we appreciate it. We do. Um, and, and we, you know, and we, and we are here um, as always, even though it's not as always, um, and and we we are so grateful for the support that we've received with received with, from our community and with online sales and everybody being patient with everything takes longer right now and, and we get that and everyone's been very patient and gracious and we thank you and yes we are still here with books for you um, and if you have a local indie where you are please buy books from them um, or go to bookshop.org like Scott was saying and then you can support indies everywhere um, but start with your local indie first and, and if you're here with us in an event um we sure do appreciate you buying a book from us if you have means to buy a book and, and we thank you and and we are all in it together that's absolutely how we feel um so uh, with that i will say thank you again to everyone who's joined us this evening and thank you so much to scott gould um, for coming back to Malaprops in a way and uh, sharing your new book with us. And congratulations on the next one coming out. Right. Um, and George, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to see you again as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank, thank you, George. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it, man. See you in 2023. Okay. <laughs>